you would, take your copy of the Scriptures and open with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There we will read verses 1 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. For we know if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands. Meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned for us this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore we are always confident, and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we pray today that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I love a story. I think I first heard it from Jim, Den- Jim Dennison about a, a missionary couple back in the early part of the last century who had been serving Christ faithfully overseas. Uh, they had been had spent a whole career telling people about Jesus, serving those who were sick and hurting, uh, serving Christ's church in a foreign land. It came time for them to come back home. This was a day and age where travel was difficult, and so it isn't a lot like missionaries today where they tend to come back and forth with some frequency. It had been years since they'd been home, and so they 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 get on an ocean liner ready to cross the Atlantic Ocean, coming back to the United States, and lo and behold, who is on that boat with them? None other than President Theodore Roosevelt. They get on this, and so there's lots of fanfare. There are journalists and all sorts of things. He had been on one of the safaris that he was famous for. As they begin to ride, they, it wasn't as if they thought that they should get as much attention as the president, but this was a day and age where missionaries sometimes would be interviewed by journalists. Sometimes reports of their, their work would make even popular newspapers. It's, it's strange to us today, I know, but there was a day and age where stuff like that would make the news. But, but in the end, they said, it's okay, it's okay. When we get home, There will be a great celebration for us. The people from our mission board, from our church, they're going to meet us there at the dock, at the port, and and we will have a celebration to celebrate all that God has done in our ministry. Unfortunately, when they arrived in port, there had been some sort of scheduling mix-up, and it sometimes happens to you and to me, the people who were supposed to be be, be there to greet them were not. It always fills us with sadness, right, when we expect to have a homecoming and someone is not there. And, and they were just filled with, with a great letdown. There were all sorts of people there to welcome the president home, and yet no one there to greet them. And the husband especially was just furious at this oversight. He said, all these years, we have worked faithfully in Africa. We have sent reports home. We have done good work. The kingdom of God has been impacted, and yet no one is here to welcome us home. And he was going on and on and on until his long-suffering wife said, Honey, why don't you go and take a walk? So he went out, and he began to walk among the city, and he was gone for quite a while. When he finally came back, his countenance had totally changed. He was, he was lifted up in spirit. His wife could tell that, that some kind of transforming work had happened in his soul. And she looked at him and said, what, what made the change? He said, well, I just did what we do when we pray. I told the Lord how angry I was. I, I hope you hear me over and over again. When you're upset, uh, when you're angry, when you're sad, when you're doubtful, those are faithful prayers if that's what you're feeling inside. This missionary gives us a wonderful example of that. He says, I took all my anger to the Lord uh, that, that told him about how upset I was that we had come home after faithfully serving him, but we were all alone. We were at home, but there was no one there to celebrate with us, no one there to care for us after we had cared for so many. He said, on and on I complained until finally the Lord whispered into my ear, who told you that you were home? It's a good word for us, isn't it? As we live this life, 
We've been spending six weeks talking about how we are on a journey towards home. We are searching for home. And that we spend our days in this life looking for places that we can call home in the here and now. When we grow up, that's with our parents or grandparents or others who have raised us. And that may or may not be a good home. But whether it's a good home or not, we grow up and we move out and we spend the rest of our days trying to find some other place called home. A place where we can belong. A place where we can serve a place where we can grow, a place where we can love and be loved. This is what we spend a lifetime looking for. And we go looking for it in all sorts of places, don't we? We look for it in our homes. This is why we spend so much time trying to fix up our houses or our apartments. This is why we buy better homes and gardens. Used to we would buy magazines. Now we get on Pinterest and we do all of these things in an effort to think that if we could just make a perfect place, we would be at home. This is why we work so hard at school or at work so that maybe we will be valued by others and we will have a place that we can call home. We even do that at church sometimes, don't we? thinking if we just serve enough, if we just help enough, if we just show up enough, then maybe this place will be my home and will meet my deepest longings. The story of the missionary reminds us that no matter where we find ourselves in this life, we may have glimpses of home. We may have places that that are kind to us. We may have places that give us a, a place to use our gifts. We may have places where we grow. And all of these are good things, gifts from God. But friends, we must always remember We are not home yet. Whenever we try to find our deepest longings, our deepest deepest needs, as long as we think those will be met by places in the here and now, we will be disappointed because we were meant for more than this. C.S. Lewis really talks about this back. He says that, that really this desire for a home really points us to the fact that you and I We're made for more. If you've read his book, Mere Christianity or other works, he's always talking about the fact that we have basic desires in life. How many of you are already hungry right now? You can go ahead and admit it. Like, Pastor, let's speed this up. My stomach's growling. Right? We we get hungry. We have a desire for food. And C.S. Lewis says, and lo and behold, there is something called food. And we eat. That desire is met by something that actually meets that desire. He he goes on to say we we are thirsty and there is something to drink. He says we have sexual desires and there is something called sex, a gift from God. We have all sorts of desires and at the end of all of those desires is something that God has given us. In fact, the desires are themselves a a God-given pointer towards something that you and I need. He writes then, he says, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. That is, he gives us this picture that we all have this longing for life deep down inside of us, a life where we belong, a life where we matter, and a life that goes on and on. We have this desire, and C.S. Lewis says, it's not a proof of God, but it is a pointer towards God, that if God has given us this desire for this longing for eternal life, then that desire itself points to the reality that you and I were made to live forever. Of course, we know that in this life, what happens? We have this deep desire to be alive, to be fully alive, but can we maintain that? I mean, maybe there's this brief period in our teenage years where we are in the best shape of our lives, where everything we do seems to succeed. We don't know it, that that's happening in our teenage years, but then what happens? It goes downhill from there. Just this weekend, my family was spending a lake day, and this way I'd already planned the sermon, but, but then I had too much evidence of my sermon in that lake day because we had some paddle boards, you know, the thing where it looks like a surfboard and you paddle on it, and my kids jump out there, and man, they just, they're looking good. In fact, John Curtis goes to show off. He's out in the middle of the lake doing push-ups on the paddle board, flipping over and doing sit-ups, and, and so, I, you know, it looks pretty easy, right? He's 11, so I get out there, and I mean, I could... You know, I'm paddling away from the shore, and I already hear the cackles of my family behind me, Because there's this wobbling that I'm thinking, where did the wobbling come from? I I don't understand why I'm wobbling so much. And here's the reason, because I'm getting older, and these bodies of ours don't last forever. And yet we have inside of us what? A deep longing for life. C.S. Lewis and other Christians through the ages have said that longing is actually evidence that God, he wants to give us life. Look at this passage with me again. There Paul says, notice, we groan and we long to be clothed 
instead with our heavenly dwelling. Paul's been, he spent all of chapter four and really the first part of this chapter talking about the troubles we experience in this life. Paul knew what it was to have troubles, to be beaten and shipwrecked, to, to encounter the problems that we all encounter in this life. And he says we have a deep longing to really lay aside this tent that we carry around our life in. We long to be clothed and said with something more. He's, of course, speaking about eternal life, that you and I were made more than just for life on this planet. We were made to live forever, forever with God. But what does that life look like? We know that these bodies are broken, so is the goal of life just to escape these bodies? That's really what some ancient Greeks thought. They thought of the body as a prison for the soul. And really what they longed more than anything else was the day that they would escape these bodies and be pure spirit. Sometimes in our pop culture, that's what we think of heaven like, pure spirit. We think of heaven as something where where you exist only in a spiritual form. But that's really not the biblical view of heaven. It wasn't the desire of the Jews. When the Jews thought of bodies, they thought God made these bodies. In fact, Greeks often thought that that bodies were, were the creation of really an evil demigod that trapped our souls. But the Jews thought what? No, the God of all creation made our bodies. And he made them. And then he looked at them and he said, what? It is good. In fact, when he made our bodies, human bodies, he said, it is very good. So Jews have always had an understanding that the body is actually something good, is a gift from God. And, th- and they, they believe that our bodies weren't just bodies. They were enlivened. They are animated by a spirit. And really when they talked about a soul, they almost meant all of that together. When the psalmist says, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. It's really body and spirit. Let everything that I have praise the Lord. And so when Jews begin to think about the afterlife and they begin to think about death and they begin to think about what does life everlasting look like, they really couldn't envision it without a body. In fact, when they think of just being a spirit, they wonder how that spirit could ever really be truly alive. The psalmist in Psalm 6, 5 is really, he's about to die. He's sick and he's wanting God to save him. And he says, for in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? His pessimism is, because really he hasn't been given a full picture of God's revelation in Jesus yet, but his pessimism was he couldn't understand how a spirit without a body could praise the Lord. Jews always had this longing. It began to develop in the Old Testament and comes to realization in Jesus that what we really long for is not to escape our bodies, but to be given resurrection bodies. So that by the time of Jesus, that most Jews, that there were a few exceptions like the Sadducees, but most Jews were longing for the day when God would show up once and for all and all of the faithful in Israel would be raised from the dead. In fact, that's a lot of arguments with Jesus among the religious leaders of that day of what would that look like. And then Jesus here gives us the perfect example of what it means for life, for death to be swallowed up by life. That's Paul, this is his picture of resurrection in this passage. Notice he doesn't want us to be naked. That's a strange phrase for us, isn't it? He says, you know, when these tents wear out, we don't want to be found naked. What he means there is we, we don't want spirits without bodies. We instead want to be clothed, he says, with a heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. What the Jews longed for was not an escape from a body, but rather to be given a resurrection body. And Paul says, this is why God made us. Look at verse 5. He says, now the one who has fashioned us for what? For this very purpose. Why has God made us? He has made us that we might, we might have life, abundant life in the here and now, and everlasting life with him forever. It is, we are fashioned for this very purpose by God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. For Paul, the very presence of the Spirit in our lives, the Holy Spirit, is a guarantee that Jesus Christ will one day come again and we will be raised from the grave. We will be given resurrection bodies. He can believe this because it is the Spirit by which God the Father raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So the Spirit's presence in our life is a reminder of what the Spirit has already done in Jesus and what the Spirit will do for us on the day Christ comes again. And so when we have the Spirit's presence, you and I can take courage that these longings we have for everlasting life will indeed be met in Christ. Now, does this mean we just sit around and twiddle our thumbs? No, Paul says that we we must then live 
by faith. Because can you and I see eternal life today? Like, do we have a glimpse of it? Do we have any kind of veil that we can pull aside and peek into the heaven this morning? No. Now, we do believe that when we love one another, when we experience these tastes of home in our own homes or here at church, it's a glimpse of what is to come. But we must really receive that that is something that points to heaven by faith. Paul says in this passage, we don't live by sight, but by faith. But we live in such a way that everything we do, we seek to please the Lord. Because we believe that we will indeed have life everlasting with him. We do that in a couple of ways. First, we do that by enjoying this life. And see, the Greeks, when the Greeks thought that life, the whole goal of life was to escape life, that went in one of two directions. For some of it meant you don't enjoy life because this is all temporary and passing away. So you want to be, you want to be stoic. You, you want to be uh, unmoved by, by either the pleasures or the troubles of this world. And you can understand if you think what's real is the spirit and that the physical has no importance at all, that may be one way you go. And some Christians sometimes act like that, but, but that's not the case. If God is going to give us a new heaven and a new earth with a physical presence, then the proper enjoyment of physical ple- pleasures on this life is one way of saying to God, God, thank you for life in the here and now, and Lord, thank you in advance for life to come. I think this is why. When we gather for meals and we we eat good food, and it fills us with pleasure, that that is actually a holy activity because we can pause and say, look, God could have made the world where we just had fuel that had no taste, but he didn't do that, did he? Because he loved us. He gave us things that taste wonderful, and when we eat them and we say, man, that was good, we ought to go ahead and add on a glory hallelujah because it is God who gave us those gifts. And as we eat those things and we enjoy them, and when we think back to your grandmother's fried chicken or to our pecan pie, and you think, oh, I'd love to eat that again. I have good news for you, friends. One of the best pictures we have of what heaven looks like is a grand feast. And I don't think that's metaphoric. I think someday we will sit in the kingdom of God, a new heaven and a new earth. And friends, we will eat well. And when we eat here and now, Let it always be a reminder for us that we shall one day feast in the kingdom of heaven. But the other extreme, of course, in the Greeks was if the body doesn't matter, they would also say what? Do whatever you want. If it doesn't matter, it's all going to burn up. Just, just do whatever you want. And, and, and you had certain Greeks that would do that. They, they would live and they would, they would commit every kind of sin possible because they said life doesn't really matter, matter at all. The physical doesn't matter. And that's not where... The Christian response goes at all. Paul understands that what we do in this life matters and has consequences for the life to come. So his his advice here is that while we know that we are not ultimately at home until we are with the Lord, we are still to please the Lord with all we do in the here and now. We are to eat with thanksgiving, but not with gluttony. We are to enjoy the physical pleasures of life, but only within the proper confines of marriage. We are to enjoy the physicalness of this life without deceiving ourselves that this earth will last forever. We enjoy those things, but always in obedience as we long for the day when Christ comes again and sets all things right once and for all. Paul says that we can do this because we have the most realistic picture of what the world is like. Not a world that doesn't matter, but a world that matters as it relates to God's plans. Uh, We must receive this, of course, by faith, which means this week when you go out and live your life, it means you can enjoy good things without despairing because you trust that in some way those good things are connected to even better things in the life to come. But you can go also out this week and make all the sacrifices you need because you trust that the sacrifice in this life is not the end for there is what? A life to come. And even if we grow frustrated in the here and now, we can take those frustrations to God but hopefully hear his word to us. Remember, remember, you are not home yet. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we are so grateful for your provisions and your promises in our lives. 
We're so grateful that you've given us this life. That, Lord, to, to enjoy one another's company, to enjoy eating together, to enjoy, Lord, the, the smell of flowers and the, the glory of a sunset. And Lord, all of this is a part of this physical world that you made and declared good. And Lord, for this we give you thanks. But Lord, help us to always remember that because of sin and, and the brokenness of this world, that our true home resides on the other side of redemption. The redemption not only of our souls, but of all things. And that, Lord, we should look forward in grateful anticipation of the day when we know life in full. Lord, in ways we've never known it before. In glory with you. Lord, as we gather at this table today, as we eat this bread and drink this cup, May these be physical reminders of the promise of glory ahead. We pray this in your name. Amen.